We are continuing on our study in the life of Jesus, and uh, we are in the Gospel of Luke today, in the second chapter, continuing with the narrative of the Gospel, and uh, what took place after we saw the uh, shepherds uh, visit the birth place of Jesus. And if you will take up the reading in chapter 2 of Luke with me, starting at verse 21, We would like to read through to verse 39. Today we are speaking about the presentation of Jesus in the temple and uh, the events that surround that time. Praise God. Verse 21, Luke chapter 2. And when eight days were accomplished after the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall peace through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity, and she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she, coming in that instant, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake of him to all them that looked for the redemption in Jerusalem. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. Praise God. In that reading today, you've read four times that Mary and Joseph we're doing something according to the law of the Lord, according to what the Lord directed. And it shows uh, quite clearly how that they were dedicated, they were consecrated, they were interested and very much involved in obeying the law of God. All the way through we find that these are the sort of people that God selected, obedient people, people that lived according to the revelation of God at that time. And uh, I'm so thankful for the fact that God looks at the heart. He knows the heart. He knows how we function. He knows and sees the desires of our heart. Quite clearly, Joseph and Mary uh, were fulfilling all of the customs, all of the dictates, the directives of the law. Well, it was the eighth day that was accomplished. And as per Jewish custom, eight days into the birth of a child, a child would be taken to be circumcised and named. And in this case... The eight days of the birth of Jesus had been completed 
and uh, Mary and Joseph took the child to be circumcised. And uh, as you recall, circumcision was a, a necessary, a very specific sign uh, of covenant between God and Israel. And it was given by God to Abraham way back in Genesis. In fact, you'll find that in Genesis chapter 17, verses 9 uh, to 12. In fact, let me turn there with you and uh, let's read that little uh, short passage because it holds some interesting information I would like to share with you. Genesis 17 and verses 9 through to 12. Now, of course, the uh, Old Testament speaks a great deal about the circumcision and it's important, but it was here that it was established as a sign or a, a symbolism, a flag, if you please, of God's people belonging to God. And it started with Abraham, the father of the faithful, uh, the father of Israel, in fact, the father of all uh, those who believe and in whom all nations of the earth have been blessed. So Genesis 17, verse 9, it says, And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. And this is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man-child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and and you. Verse 12 is important. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house or brought, bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. And it goes on to explain that all that belonged to those uh, of Israel, whether they were children, adopted children, or whether they were even servants, if they were to be part of the commonwealth of Israel, they had to be circumcised. It was a sign between God and the people of Israel. But what is interesting in verse 12 is that it specifically says eight days. In other words, the child had to be eight days of age uh, before they would be circumcised. Notice this was so important that at the earliest possible time it was done. But the question that has often been asked is why eight days? Why did they have to wait that long? Well, of course, we serve a God who knows the end from the beginning and has all the wisdom and knowledge. It is only in recent times that man has discovered there is something very important that happens in the early days of a child's life. Let me share this with you to show you the accuracy and beauty of God's Word. People say the Bible is not a scientific book. That's true. In, in context, it isn't a book written to prove science, but it holds many, many things that are well and truly beyond the human science or knowledge of man. Well, it, it, uh, it was in 1935 that a doctor proposed the name of vitamin K to uh, describe a certain vitamin in the body. And what was discovered also was that vitamin K was responsible for the production by the liver of the element known as prothrombin. Now, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, prothrombin is actually, along with vitamin K, responsible for clotting your blood. In other words, when you cut yourself, you've watched a cut that becomes clotted and, and uh, the blood stops flowing. How does that happen before the cut is even closed? It's because of blood clotting, coagulation, that God has established in the body, a system by which the, it stems the flow of blood. Well, this doesn't happen by accident. It is because of this vitamin K that is in the system. Scientists and doctors have researched and discovered that this vitamin K, along with this prothrombin, is actually responsible for the, uh, for the stopping of the blood flow, in other words, for coagulations. And so what is also interesting is that following his research and studies in 1953, more doctors and researchers discovered uh, that and observed that in newborn infants there is a peculiar susceptibility for bleeding between the second and fifth day of life. What is interesting is that in those times they can hemorrhage. In fact, babies can actually die if they lose too much of their blood. So obviously if vitamin K is produced in sufficient uh, quantities and not until between the fifth and the seventh day, uh, it is wise to postpone any surgery until after the seventh day or the eighth day onwards. Now, what is amazing about this is that this was not known 
by science until the 1950s. So how did Abraham know to do this on the eighth day? Notice, God said, you will do it on the eighth day. Now, what science could never have imagined is this next scientific fact, which is really amazing. Listen to this. What they've discovered is that on the eighth day, don't forget there is virtually no vitamin K, no chance of coagulation in the first five days. It begins and kicks in from day six and seven, and it's not until day eight that prothrombin in a baby is actually not just present, but get this, elevated for that one day to more than 100% of its normal level that it will ever be in the life of that male child for the rest of his life. Did you just get that? Not only God knew, of course, because of His creation, He made the vitamin, He made the body, He made the functionality of it. Not only did He know that it was present and communicated that to, uh, to Abraham to do it in this manner, but of course He has so scheduled it that on the eighth day, out of her entire male life, as you guys, as I'm talking to you, our f us fellows, the entire life, that one eighth day of life, your prothrombin is at a hundred percent more percentage than it will ever be. Is God good? Yeah. Amen. So you start circumcising him on the eighth day. Meaningful, isn't it? When you understand the plan, the mind of God, beautiful. And so. Long before, thousands of years before man came to this knowledge by their own research, God already had shared that wisdom with humanity. Abraham didn't pick the eighth day after many centuries of research and discovery. He did simply what God showed him to do. Uh, he listened, he obeyed the Creator of the vitamin K. Amen. He he, the one that created the system, and of course as such, uh, it was accurate. Praise the Lord. The answer, of course, is uh, to how did he have access to such information? How could he possibly have known? Well, the Bible tells you every scripture is inspired of God. Amen. It comes by inspiration of God. So when God says something, we may not fully understand it. We don't, may not comprehend why, but he has a reason. And in this case, you can see from this simple event that used to happen every day in Jewish life, a new baby would be born, and eight days later they would be circumcised. Never before. Why eight days? We serve a God who has great wisdom, great knowledge, amen, and has great power. And uh, He tells us to do things in a certain way for very good reasons. I pray that that strengthens yet again your confidence in obeying God. Sometimes you don't understand why God tells you to do something in a certain way, but obey Him anyway because it's the Lord's way. Amen. Glory to God. Aren't you glad you know Jesus today? Amen. We serve a great creator. Well, on that day uh, of the circumcision, he was named Jesus, according to Scripture says, as the angel had delivered or announced to Mary before he was conceived in the womb. And you may remember we studied that when the angel appeared and gave the announcement to Mary. He explained that the baby would be conceived in her womb by the power of the Holy Ghost overshadowing her. And uh, he would be called Jesus, the Bible says, because he will save his people from their sins. Amen? Amen. And indeed, it is the name of salvation that removes sin to this day. God is so good, his word so perfect. And everything that he tells us is laden with his power and his wisdom. Read the Word of God with confidence and joy, knowing that it reflects, it tells you, it shares with you the wisdom of the Almighty God. Let's read uh, verse 22 to, tw to 24 there. It says, And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Uh, this uh, is an account, again, of Mary and Joseph's obedience to the law of God. It refers to the days of her purification. Uh, if you care to read about the detail on that, uh, make a, a note of Leviticus chapter 12. The first few verses will tell you that when a woman gave birth to a child, uh, a male child, she had to go through a certain uh, period of purification of washings for seven days. And so it was after that time of washing 
where during which, of course, uh, there would be no intimacy with her husband, there would be no uh, closeness because of the blood and so forth that would uh, issue from her. God was protecting his people in those days where there weren't uh, the sort of facilities and running water and so forth and hygiene necessarily that we have today. And in his wisdom, once again, he gave specific laws to cover, to protect his people. And so after the time of her purification, they came to present the child to the Lord. Now what is interesting is that in this presentation to God, there was a very important act signified. If you read in verse 23, it says, As it is written, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy unto God. You see, God had stipulated that every firstborn male would be actually considered separated for the service of God. In other words, would have to enter into the ministry, would have to be a servant in the temple, would have to serve as a priest in the house of God. God then selected the Levites as being the actual priest uh, tribe to serve in the temple rather than people from all the tribes. And so he selected a specific tribe and he told the people, however, that the firstborn that uh, came from every woman was still holy unto God and that they would have to redeem him, meaning make an offering unto God to keep him from entering into the ministry. Okay, So in other words, to, uh, to have him as part of their family rather than to enter the priesthood family, if you please. And so this was the idea of the offering that you're reading about in these verses. There was a lamb to be offered and so forth. But the scripture says that if a person was too poor or couldn't afford the lamb, they could bring two turtle doves or two pigeons, uh, a very small offering, if you please. But nevertheless, a token, a sacrifice unto God uh, in, as a redemption of the birth of that firstborn son. And so that's exactly what Mary and Joseph were doing. They were going to Jerusalem to dedicate the child, to redeem by the means of this uh, simple offering, but in obedience doing exactly what the Word of God, what the law of God had directed them. It's good to obey God's Word, isn't it? And God blesses us when we are obedient to the Word of God. Please never make the mistake of thinking that uh, you, you can just sidestep the Word of God or that you may do it another time in another way or that you may choose your own uh, you know, choice of obedience. Uh, God sets out His Word in a very specific way and being obedient specifically is how we are to be. So offering uh, the redemption offering in the temple was part of their responsibility and their obedience unto God. If you read then from verse 25, something interesting happens as they are in the temple and offering the offering and presenting the child before God. In verse 25, we read of a man. It says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. First of all, we are told that he's a local. He's from Jerusalem. And he has been around a while. The Bible says that he is just and devout. That refers to two things. Firstly, the fact that he was, again, a man obedient to the Word of God. He was just. He was doing righteousness. But also he was devout. He was a man of prayer. He was potentially maybe involved in the ministry there, the priesthood, we don't know. But he certainly was in the temple uh, frequently, he was devout. And what is interesting about this man, it says that he was waiting. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Amen. Now, of course, every Jew knew that the consolation of Israel would come. The consolation of Israel is a terminology the Jews used uh, to describe the Messiah to come when they would be consoled from their slavery and delivered from the nations that they were overrunning them. Jewish people believed, and uh, rightly so, according to Scripture, that Messiah would come to deliver them and to reestablish His kingdom on earth. Praise the Lord. And so uh, they were awaiting this Messiah. But this man um, awaited in a different manner. Quite clearly, he, he awaited in faith. And uh, he, he waited for the consolation of Israel on a very daily basis, it appears. Uh, what is beautiful about this is that he also, uh, the scripture says, was anointed uh, of the Holy Ghost. Have a look there in verse 25. It says, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Now, you understand uh, this is prior to Pentecost, and we've seen this a few times in the narrative of the gospel, how the Holy Spirit has come upon Elizabeth and upon Mary and so forth. And so we know that there is a 
touch of God and a moving of God's Spirit upon individuals. This is not the infilling as we know it now by, uh, since Pentecost. But we do know that individuals were being moved upon by the Holy Ghost right through the entire Old Testament. And once again here we see this man uh, was under the unction of the Holy Spirit. I believe because he was prophesying and because he had the spirit of prophecy upon him, this is exactly what this anointing is referring to. The Holy Ghost was upon him. Another interesting uh, point or fact about Simeon is that he was given a great revelation. Uh, look at this, verse 26, it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death. He's not going to die until he has seen the Lord's Christ, the Lord's Messiah. Now, he's obviously an older gentleman. He has lived all of his life and he's had this promise from God and he knows that he's not going to die until his eyes see the Messiah. Isn't that amazing? Imagine having such a promise and he'd live with that hope in his heart every day. He would go to the temple and he would look at the babies that daily would be brought into the temple to be dedicated to the Lord and the, the redemption offering would be offered and he would sense after God and sense after the Spirit, is this the Messiah? Is this the Messiah? And every day he would have a negative. No, this is not the one. Not the one. I'm not sure how many weeks, months, years this went, went on for, but every day he would go with that renewed knowledge that said he would not die until his eyes would behold the Messiah. What a beautiful and confident promise. And on this day, on this day, the Bible says something very specific. It says that he came by the Spirit into the temple. Can you get the emphasis on that? He didn't just turn up at the temple. At the normal, he came by the Spirit. In the, God led him by His Spirit. You know, it's so important that we are led by the Spirit of God. Amen? Can you say amen to that? Yes? Amen. amen. You see, in order to do what we are to do, we must be led of the Spirit of God. And so God led him at this very time into this very place to be a testimony about this one very child. And here was something different this day. Simeon, who had no doubt uh, made a point of observing and looking at every child that came into that temple to be presented this day, when he laid eyes on the baby child Jesus, he knew, the Holy Ghost showed him, he knew without a shadow of doubt, this was the Messiah. Hallelujah. The promise of God had been fulfilled. God in the Spirit told him uh, that this was the one. Praise God. And so, you know, we need to be led of the Spirit of God. Praise the Lord. This is, in fact, a mark, a flag, a sign that we are the children of God. I believe it's Romans chapter 8, I think it's verse 14, that tells you, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Can you see how important it is for us to follow uh, after the Spirit, to be led of the Spirit of God. Allow Him to lead you. Uh, don't be surprised at the wonderful, amazing things that God will direct you to do if you sense after the Spirit of God and you're sensitive to His voice and follow after Him. Man and woman and child alike can be sensitive to the Spirit of God and God will speak to you. He will lead you. He will reveal to you as He did in this case to Simeon. Let's have a look at his message, his praise, first of all, and his message as he recognizes the Messiah, uh, the Savior that has come to the world. I can only imagine the joy that fills this man's heart as he lays eyes on this child and God says, this is the one. This is the Messiah. All of his years of waiting, all of the hope and faith and trust that he had put in God, in that promise that God had given him, now was being fulfilled. Verse 28, he took him up in his arms. And the Bible says he blessed God. And then he said, Lord, now let us thou, thy servant, depart in peace according to thy word. The first thing he does is to praise God for his promise to him. He knew that he would not pass away until he had seen uh, the Savior of the world, until he had seen the Messiah come. And uh, in verse 30, he gives this glorious testimony, For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Hallelujah. We can rejoice with Simeon, can't we? 
Amen. His eyes have seen the salvation. When he looked at that baby boy, he knew. He knew this was God manifest in the flesh. He knew this was the Messiah that had been promised for centuries and centuries. He knew this was the one that Isaiah had spoken about and Zechariah had spoken about, that all of the prophets had so much to say about. Mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Praise God. You know something? You and I can have amazing discernment through the Spirit of God if we will just stay attuned. These things do not come by human knowledge. They come by supernatural anointing. Amen. Please understand, as humans, we are no better than anybody else. But we, those who are filled with the Holy Ghost of God, amen, we have something that it goes beyond human capacity. Please learn to rely on the Holy Spirit of God. You are filled with the Spirit for a very good reason. God will grant you wisdom. He will grant you discernment. He will grant you knowledge, ability, and power if you will sense after Him, if you'll stay attuned to Him. And uh, we see an example in this man. And notice his age has nothing to do with it. He is there in the anointing of God. And you can see how in his mind, uh, in the Jewish mind, uh, the Messiah was always connected to salvation. As soon as he sees the Messiah, he recognizes him as a Messiah, he says, I have seen your salvation, God. There was salvation attached to the coming of the Messiah. Praise the Lord. And then he says, which you have prepared before the face of all the people in verse 31. You see, God had made ready His plan. He had made ready His salvation. He had uh, made ready and fulfilled His promise. And He did it in a way openly for everybody to see. What is sad about this truth is the fact that so many, uh, in fact the Jews to begin with, and even to this day, so many, overall, close their eyes and they refuse to see the salvation of God. They close their eyes to the truth. In his own day, Jesus was denounced. He was ridiculed. He was bypassed. And so many chose not to see because they had a preconceived idea of what the Messiah would be like, how he would come. And he didn't come according to their expectations. And so they, they rejected him. They closed their eyes. They failed to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. And isn't that exactly the picture that we see largely in the world today? They would disband and dismiss Christ. They would try to minimize and criticize and ridicule. And even if they do uh, think uh, somewhat of him, is just some distant individual, some character uh, who they do not know personally. It is your task and mine to share with others the truth of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. Amen? The salvation that He has brought. Brother and sister, it's up to you and I to share the glorious things of God that He has done in your life with others. The Apostle Paul said that this knowledge of God was excellent and that he had traded everything in life for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. And so what you have in Christ, what you and I have, is this amazing, excellent preciousness of a knowledge that we ought to share with others. We need to make certain that we are ready to share the beautiful things that God has given us, both by our words and by our example. Share Jesus. Sometimes people are so blind that they will not see, and the only chance, the only opportunity they may ever have of seeing Jesus, recognizing Him as the Savior of the world, may be in your life, in your testimony, through the things that you will say and do. Verse 32 tells you uh, the purpose for which he came. And again, this is great revelation of God for a Jewish person to say this. Look what he says. He's come for a light, to be a light, to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. You can just see Simeon absolutely overwhelmed by the power and glory and blessing and anointing of God as he holds that baby and he says, this is the light that's come to lighten the Gentiles. You know, he was actually almost quoting uh, Isaiah. If you write it down, Isaiah, I think it's not chapter 9 in verse 2, uh, it actually tells you that there was a people that sat in darkness. And the people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. That great light was seen in Christ Jesus, in the salvation, in the message that He brought. 
uh, both the Jews at this time set in great darkness, but also the Gentiles. Notice he refers to the Gentiles specifically uh, that were in darkness. And the prophecy here is that the salvation of Israel would become the salvation of the world. The Savior that came amongst Israel, the Messiah that was the promised Christ that would come to Israel would become the Savior of the world. Hallelujah. What a great truth uh, this man was able to see through the Spirit of God. And of course, it was also reflecting the glory of God through Israel. They were called to be priests and kings unto God to share the message of salvation, to share the message of God amongst the people. So this was the glory of Israel. And Jesus came fulfilling the salvation uh, to dispel the darkness, bringing light, and to bring and show forth the glory of God through Israel. Praise God. Well, verse 33 is interesting to me because it says, Joseph and his mother, Mary, marveled at those things which were spoken of him. They, they were amazed. He was a man that they'd never met before. Just all of a sudden turns up in the temple. Of course, they don't know the timing of God, but God does. And he takes their child into his arms and says these amazing things about Jesus, which, of course, having known how Jesus came about, you would think, well, they shouldn't be surprised at anything, right? I mean, after all, they were both aware that this was a conception that came from heaven itself. But you cannot be and stop being amazed at the things of God. Amen? I mean, think about it. Do you and I know about heaven right now? Yeah, we read about it, we study it. But I guarantee when we turn up in heaven, we're going to be, wow, amazed. Yes, we were told. Yes, we were shown. But the reality, it's going to, you can never stop being amazed at the glory, at the power, at the majesty, at the beauty and wisdom of God. Amen? Like John in Revelation many times, we will be unable to speak uh, at the things that we will see. Hallelujah. Verse 34 is significant in this sense that Simeon now speaks not to God. He has just given praise to God. But now he actually speaks to Mary. He says something prophetic, something once again that he couldn't have known except through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I can't stress this enough, saints of God, this entire passage about the presentation of the temple was. It's a beautiful concept of dedicating our children. And this is why we still do it, by the way, uh, dedicate our children to the Lord. But really, the impact here is the anointing of the Holy Spirit and how important it is for us to sense and to follow after the Spirit of God. Look what he says to Mary uh, in verse 34. He speaks to her. He says some things about the child and about her. Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother behold this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against verse 35 he says yea a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also that the thoughts of well, many thanks. hearts be revealed amen and so what we find here is prophetic utterances, you can see that in context, although the scripture doesn't specifically call Simeon a prophet, that that is exactly what he's doing. He's invested with the spirit of, of prophecy and he speaks in prophetic utterance and he says some very important things. First of all, the child is set for the fall and rising of many. If you will turn with me quickly to Isaiah chapter 8. Have a look there with me. Isaiah chapter 8. Let's read verse 14 in particular. You will find that this concept is repeated also in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 14. It says, And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a, a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a jinn, and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And the Apostle Paul, you recall, when he actually spoke in regards to the gospel, he stated how that it was a stumbling block to the Jew, and really it was foolishness to the Greek. You see, everything about Jesus, everything about his message, about the way he came, 
the way that God fulfilled his promise of the Messiah was somehow contrary or at least not what the Jews had expected. They had expected a different Messiah, a Messiah who would come in glory and power. They were expecting the end result, meaning what's yet to come in the future, the establishment of Christ's kingdom on earth at the very, very end. Uh, they, that's what they had expected. But what came was a humble child in a manger. What came was a baby almost unknown to anybody else except that heaven itself announced it uh, via angels and many other very distinguishable signs. And so when you, when you look at the scriptures, you can see why he prophesies what he does. He says that many will be set for a fall and many for a rising. So what does it mean? Well, you see, many would be ruined. Literally, the fall there means a ruin. They would be ruined because of their unbelief. They would not accept the Messiah that had come. And so the coming of this baby, this child who was Christ, the anointed of God, the Messiah, God manifest in flesh, would be both the fall of many because they would disbelieve and discard the Messiah. And how true is that? A rock of offense, a, a rock of stumbling. So many to this day reject the Messiah. And, and therefore the truth of God becomes a judgment of God upon them. Can you see that? The very same truth that can save is the same truth that will judge. And it's all to do with whether we accept Christ or not. With whether we believe in Him or not. With whether we make Him our Savior or not. Brothers and sisters, you are privileged to know Jesus as your personal Savior. Let me tell you, you are counted amongst those that are rising. Amen. Those that are blessed. Those that are, in fact, blessed of God. So it says that with the coming of this child, in this child, he says, many shall fall, many shall rise. Why would some rise? For the very same reason that when the Messiah comes, they would rise and be blessed by believing in faith that he is the Messiah, that he is the Savior of the world. And that, that you can see the picture that still takes place today. Not just back in the days of the Jews back in the old times, but in this day, people have to do something with Christ. And whether they, they choose to believe or to disbelieve, they will have a result. So remember this, that through faith, many are made to see. Amen. But through unbelief, many are made blind. Through faith, many are made to rise by the knowledge and truth that is found in Christ. But through unbelief, through that same knowledge, many are condemned and they will condemn themselves. Many will fall and go to their ruin, to their perdition. One day they will stand before God and their question won't be whether they knew or didn't know about God. The question is what did they do about the truth that they had heard? This is why our lives are so important. They're here today, they're gone tomorrow, but in that meanwhile, we have to choose for God. Amen. A beautiful truth of Scripture. Well, it says that this child shall be for a fall and a rising of many in Israel and, of course, in the world, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Now, that word there in the Greek, that word sign, literally means as it were, a target. You can imagine a, a bullseye type target that we may shoot an arrow at. That's what that word literally means, a target. A sign as in a mark, if you please. And so what Simeon is saying is, this child will be for a target, something that will be marked and spoken evil against, or spoken against. And again, do we see that from Scripture? Well, sadly, very much so. Not only then, in the days of Jesus, but to this day, both Jesus and his people are a mark. They're a target to which are aimed all kinds of negative things, unfortunately. Hatred and rejection, profanity and cursing, ridicule and opposition. And I want you to see that in our present uh, circumstances, the present climate of our society, particularly our country right now, we've become an even bigger bullseye and target uh, because society is just approved right here in our country uh, to go even further against the things of God. And that means that you and I who stand for the things of God are becoming even greater target. Your belief system is being attacked. You and who you are, what you stand for is being attacked. And in fact, you will see it because many will point a finger and call us all kinds of names.
please expect it. It's been prophesied that in Christ uh, we will, will suffer and therefore we will see some of the things that he went through. But can we overcome? Yes, because he overcame. Hallelujah. And so God has already preset what's going to happen. He has already determined that the faithful, the overcomers, are going to be rewarded. Amen. And it's our task to make sure we remain overcomers. Praise the Lord. Well, he said some other things to Mary, uh, not just in regards to the child Jesus and what would happen uh, as a result of his birth and his coming, but also to the mother herself. He says to Mary, a sword shall pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts be revealed. What Simeon did here was to, through the Lord, prepare Mary for what was to come. Mary would experience terrible anguish, terrible sorrow, when she would stand at the foot of the cross on which Jesus died. God prepared this godly woman for that painful but necessary experience and event. God gave her right here in these words of this old man Simeon, this prophet, uh, a preparation of heart, that, of something that was necessary. It had to take place, but no mother uh, would not register incredible anguish over. Any mother losing a child would suffer greatly, and I'm sure that uh, that would be a terrible thing to have to go through. But I need you to understand that here was a special circumstance. Please think of how this child had come to be Mary's child. The amazing events surrounding his conception and his birth. This was not just any normal birth. This was not just any normal child. And then consider the conditions in which Jesus suffered and died. The uh, ignominy that he suffered at the attacks of those very people that he was working to, to help. He was healing them and they, they cried crucify. He, he was reaching out to them feeding them and helping them with the gospel. And yet these very people, to, and she witnessed all of that. She witnessed the, the attacks on him, uh, the shaming of it. And then, of course, the scourging of the Roman uh, flagellation as it tore the very skin and the very flesh off of his back. And then the crucifixion and all of the suffering that went along with it and the anguish. The Bible said he was like a sword that would penetrate and pierce her very soul. Because he was not just a child. This was God in the flesh. This was something of great significance. Uh, yet his dying was a necessity. And this is really what we are seeing in this. This sword piercing her soul was a painful but necessary experience. Because Jesus was born to die. He was a lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. In the plan of God, from the very beginning of creation, already this was a sacrifice made for sin. And so she was part of the great plan and purpose of God. Can I share with you for a moment, please try to tap into this. Being part of the great plan and purpose of God does not mean it's all a bed of roses. Does not mean it's all easy street, easy going. There is some suffering implied. There is some difficulty implied. Yes, there is some loss. You know, we sometimes think that being a Christian means we should never lose. Read it. There is a time to get, a time to lose. Amen. There's a time to gather, a time to scatter. You know, God has us part of His purpose and sometimes we lose. Sometimes we ache, sometimes we pain. That doesn't make us any different in that sense from what happens to the rest of the world. The difference is this. Do we hold on to God when we go through those times? That's what's important. God has prepared us for the difficulties. He has told us to rejoice in trials. And in this case, He prepared Mary. For the sword that would pierce her soul. See, the dying of the cross was essential. And it would bring to Revelation, it says here, many thoughts or the thoughts of many hearts. And that's very important. Because you see, whether in humble submission, whether in arrogant rejection, whether in thoughtless indifference, man has to respond to the cross of Christ. 
Every individual has to respond. And how we respond reveals the condition of our hearts. Are you getting that? He prophesied that because of his death, the death of this beautiful child that had been given miraculously to Mary, an event that would pierce her soul, the hearts, the motivation, the thoughts of individuals would be revealed. This is why we seek and we ask God to bring into his flock, into his family, those that are sincere of a heart, those that are, have a heart for God, because it is revealed when they come face to face with the salvation that Jesus provided, whether or not uh, they will accept him or reject him. And accordingly, each man's response reveals the heart and whether or not they will receive the reward that comes with accepting and serving God or the judgment that comes with rejection and indifference towards the Christ and the cross. Brothers and sisters, we are part, we are very much part of the great will and purposes of God. Rejoice in that. But continue to rejoice even when the going gets tough. Even when things don't quite work out, even when you think that somehow you're suffering, remember that there is part of the plan and purpose of God that requires that of you and me also. All right, so the prophecy was very specific. She, she would suffer as a result of the loss of this child. Amen. And please remember that concept that being part of the plan and purpose of God doesn't mean a cakewalk it doesn't make it easy necessarily there are times of difficulty and that's when we need to trust God even more hold on to God remember the promises well another event took place and I'll cover this quickly it was a confirmation of Simeon's message a woman by the name of Anna the Bible says she was a prophetess a daughter of Phanuel the tribe of Asa was of great age and she lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. Verse 37 says she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, and she departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayer day and night. And she coming in that instant, notice the timing, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of Him to all that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Praise God. Uh, people would say, oh, what great coincidence. Coincidence? Hardly. Talk about plan and purpose. God had these individuals prepared possibly for years for just this one event. And if they did nothing else, they've gone down in the annals of history and into the history of God's book, His story, literally, the story of Jesus as being testimonies of who and what He is all about. The Messiah, the Christ, the Savior of the world that was to come that have been prophesied. So the scripture says some interesting things about Anna. First of all, her name is the same as the Hannah with an H of the Old Testament. It means exactly the same thing. Uh, if you don't know the meaning of that name, it means grace or the grace of God. It's a beautiful name, Anna. And she was, according to scripture, a prophetess. Now, we're not told how or why or what she prophesied, but certainly in this particular instance, no doubt, like Simeon, uh, she was a prophetess. She prophesied about the Christ and she shares this title with other women in the Bible both in the Old and New Testament women like Miriam and Deborah and Halda and also the daughters of Philip the Evangelist in Acts who are called prophetesses so these were individuals who w would come anointed of God and specifically delivering a message from God or prophesying some way or another we're told that she is the daughter of Phanuel now we don't know anything about this particular man but his name and the fact that he's from the tribe of Asher is significant. You may not recognize the name because it's spelled differently. But if you turn, I think it's Genesis. Let me see. I've got the reference. Genesis chapter 32 is where you'll read about this. And about verse 20, you will find that it's, it's actually during the time when Jacob has a, a battle with an angel. And once again, he believes he has seen God face to face. In any case, the name Penuel means literally the face of God. Isn't that beautiful? Now here is the daughter of Penuel. And who, who is she beholding? Have a look at this. The very face of God in flesh. God manifest in flesh in that baby. And she is beholding the very face of God. No coincidence, God has some things very much sorted out. Amen. So, in any case, uh, this is where she comes in. And the Bible tells us 
something about her age as well. She's quite an old woman. And I think this detail is added for your benefit and mine. As we get older, I think it's significant. Have a look at this. It says that she was a widow of about 84 years, four score and four. So she was 84 years a widow. And she had been with her husband seven years from her virginity. So she had been married for seven years. That makes it 91 years. And even assuming that she had been about 18 years old when she married somewhere thereabouts, this woman could have been as old as 109, 110 years of age. And what is she doing? Think about this. What is she doing? You know, she's daily in the temple. She's praying, the scripture says. She's fasting. She is serving God. Clearly, we're never too old to serve God. Are you getting this? Amen. If you think yourself too old to do something for God, think again. Here is a woman that's, that's living daily in service of God in whatever way she can, faithfully with prayers and with fasting and living unto God. And God uses her to testify, to signify, and yes, to uh, confirm the testimony that Simeon had given that this is indeed the Messiah. Praise God. Oh, look, son, age is not going to stop this woman from performing her faithfulness to God, and it should not stop you and I. Uh, from doing God's work and God's ways. In fact, let me say that some of the greatest prayer warriors that are known about in history are older people. They may not be able to travel any longer. They may not be able to do a whole lot, so much more, but they still faithfully uphold people in prayer. Old woman is recorded as having this little pad that she would go around the church with, you know, and she would ask people, what would you like me to pray for? And if you went into that pad, you can rest assured she made it her business to pray. These are warriors. Brothers and sisters, these are not just all the people that are feeble physically. These are great warriors. These are great people for God. People of a great God. Amen. Who are serving God in a great manner. Because prayer is not something that prepares you for the greater work. It is the greater work. In fact, without prayer, we can't do much else. Amen. This woman prayed. She fasted. She gave herself in service to God every day. The Bible says she virtually lived in the temple. She never departed from it. I believe she was there at every time of prayer, every time there was something happening. Oh, that faithfulness. You know, there's something, something about faithful people. For a pastor particularly, uh, it means so much. When you know you can turn up at church and there faithfully is that individual. They turn up. They're present. That faithfulness is so remarkable and God appreciates it. I know I as a pastor do also. We're never too old, remember, to serve God. In any case, she came in, the Bible says, at that instant. Now, five minutes later, she might have missed them. Five minutes before, she may not have noticed them, but at that instant. And what happened? She lays eyes on this child and she knows this is the Messiah. She confirms everything that Simeon has just said. And she goes on to tell other people about uh, the Messiah that has come. She not only confirmed but began telling everybody this is the promised Messiah. The fulfillment of the redemption and salvation that they have been awaiting. Hallelujah. What a trip to Jerusalem, huh? What a journey. Amen. Uh, I wonder if Joseph and Mary had imagined that their uh, act of obedience to the law of God, going to Jerusalem, making that trip to do the things that the law commanded, would have resulted in such amazing events. Stamped in the life of that child, of course, was the imprint of God in every detail. And yet again, we see it in these events that we have studied this morning. Uh, you may think it's just a historical part of the life of Jesus, but these are very significant times that happen confirming and reassuring and really strengthening our own faith in the fact that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, the Savior of the world, who came, God manifest in the flesh, who came to die for your sins and mine. Will you stand with me today? Amen. We read in verse 39 in closing, after doing all these things, Joseph and Mary returned to their city of Nazareth. No doubt their hearts were filled with joy and with expectation. If this was what's going to happen during the time of Jesus being but just a baby, what else was going to happen in this child's life? It's interesting, the Bible records mere glimpses of Jesus' life from this point onwards. But it's enough to tell us that no doubt the lives of Mary and Joseph 
with Jesus being their child were quite exciting and filled with amazing and supernatural events. Let's bow heads in prayer as we thank the Lord today uh, for what we have received. Praise the Lord. Brother Mink, can I ask you please to close the Bible study in prayer? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Hallelujah Savior. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah Jesus. Thank you, Lord, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Savior. Hallelujah. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah.